Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I was just writing as you. Were yeah, of course. Um, so uh, it's interesting that um, in the scenario, uh, his his identities are are only uh, somewhat revealed uh, later on. Um, as I was writing this, I was thinking to myself, I don't want any child to go through this kind of scenario. Um, not just uh, identified as African American. Um, there are a couple of things that, that jumped out at me in as I was listening. Uh, one is the very subjective um, definition of disrespect. Um, that's typically a, a pretty big one for uh, any school district, um, Columbia included. Um, the definition of disrespect and defiance. That's usually where um, it is coded uh, when a child is sent to the office and it is not um, uh, coded in terms of like fights or those types of things. It is that sort of nebulous and, and subjective uh, disrespect and defiance. Do you think teachers in the classroom recognize oh, that Oh, is this back and forth? Oh, no, no, I'm no, just, I, I have a, the, I just wanted to I just have a question. Do you sure, think sure, teachers sure. recognize or understand that yeah. difference? Yeah, so, um, and I was not trying to, I just wanted to understand the, how the scenarios work because otherwise I start I got over. excited. Like, um, I don't want any child to So, um, so um, one of the things that Columbia is working on in particular is um, a matrix with really clear definitions because of the fact 19,000 children, 3,000 employees, 1,500 of them are teachers, um, that um, from school to school there are sometimes uh, a different definition in a teacher's mind. That's why the work that we do when it comes to our equity work is super important because it's not just about how does one recognize how they've been socialized and, and, um, and understand what defiance and disrespect means to them, but taking uh, the time and the effort to also recognize how a, a child has, or, or peers have been socialized uh, differently potentially uh, so that they can uh, recognize that there sometimes is a different definition of what is considered disrespect. As a principal, you, you heard of a principal at West Boulevard, um, how frequently um, children would be referred to the office and when I'd ask a child, you know, why are you here, and the child would say, all I said was, what did I do? And the child did say, what did I do, right? I mean, um, how it was interpreted by his or her teacher was often uh, disrespect or defiance. Right. Um, there's such a narrow, well, I'll get there in a minute. So, um, in listening to the scenario also, it was, um, I heard, like, would it be better to teach or socialize him? And I want to, maybe we can explore that as a group because um, the, the term is a little bit problematic, uh, or a lot of it problematic, because who's doing the socializing and socialize for what end? Um, how much content and instruction is lost? when we don't tackle these types of questions and concerns and how often a child is spends just sitting in the office waiting for someone to talk with her or him most often him um and um and so it's that's my initial thoughts so far 19 referrals says to me that there's no relationship between that teacher and the child um that there has not been the daily um coming together as a school family um and recognizing um, every child uh, sees the world differently in the sense of their hopes and their dreams and their concerns. Um, and so if you circle up daily with your class, you have a better idea about what's going on in a kid's life. And so uh, it doesn't mean that you approve of certain behaviors that you find to be disruptive, um, but you accept them for where they are uh, and then move forward with that child. So those were my, my initial uh, thoughts and then concerns because when when the scenario says no chances to improve, that means that child has been spotlit, right? In terms of spotlighted, and, and every opportunity that the child um, makes a mistake is immediately um, uh, dealt with in what appears to be from your scenario being sent to the office. And that's not okay. John. Okay, so. I mean, justice is going to decide for a bit. So, uh, I'll, I'll start off with. I am by no means an expert in education. So my background is in, is in law enforcement for 21 years. I didn't start in the education environment until August of this year. So giving a, a really good 
Dr. Siebelman did a really good job of kind of saying what on the public schools. But what I'd like to do is, and maybe what I can add to this scenario is what I've observed so far um, from my limited exposure in the schools that I'm responsible for. So I have four elementary schools and then Battle High School um, are my responsibility as far as the safety and security. And what, what I have been blown away with so far in my exposure in these environments is um, that a tremendous amount of effort is being placed on trying to uh, divert kids that have challenges at home or challenges at school and trying to figure out ways for uh, them to be successful in the school environment. Uh, between the homeschool communicators, the counselors, the principals, there is a tremendous effort to build relationships uh, with the students and even more with the, than just the students, the parents. So when there is a child that, that I see that is having consistent issues, um, it's a team effort in the schools where I'm at uh, to try to figure out scenarios and ways for these students to be successful. Uh, through working with uh, counselors, out of school resources, work with parents, trying to figure out ways um, to avoid and divert kids away from uh, in school suspensions, out of school suspensions, and inevitably potentially getting law enforcement involved. So uh, that's what I've observed. Um, but as far as giving you uh, ideas on how, how to better, that, that really is a whole lot of If I can give you some more. So, um, I'm taking advice. So, what have we done in terms of real dialogue with the child's parent or guardian? Um, have we talked with previous teachers in terms of what has worked well for that for a child uh, who may be struggling in, in a classroom? Um, do we uh, do we have lunch with that child? Do we spend time with the child before or after school? Do we give child leadership opportunities? Um, have we explored the child's interests and found enrichment opportunities for, their, for that child? Ultimately, we want. Uh, to give kids, we want kids to get involved in something because when they have hope um, and they feel connected, uh, it is less likely um, that you're going to have the kind of interruptions that, that this teachers or, or whoever um, observed the scenario, um, there are fewer opportunities for, for those things to happen. Because when kid, I, I just, from my own experiences as an educator, is when children are connected to their school and their classroom and their, and their, and their teacher, um, you, you see a lot less of this. And thank you so much for addressing that. Thank you. So now we have, now we'd like to ask you, why did Columbia Public Schools adopt a zero tolerance policy? Yeah, I went to look for the zero tolerance policy. I can't find one that exists as a policy. What I can tell you is, is that um, there, uh, the state legislature has certain rules uh, that we are bound to follow. So um, the Safe Schools Act is an example of that. Uh, so a child who engages uh, in um, fairly, well, egregious acts, right? Rape, murder, uh, those types of things. But, but even down to, if a child brings a, a knife that's more than four inches long, uh, I have the, uh, I have no, uh, there's no recourse that I can follow other than to suspend the child for 180 days, it's one school year. And so when you look at like a kid who last year, two years ago, uh, a child who brings a, uh, a knife to a science fair project, right? To, to carve balsa wood, had to get 180 day suspension for bringing it. Now, the policy says that the school board has the authority to reduce that, that suspension. So as you might expect, um, I brought that immediately to the school board for them to take action. Um, but it was pretty interesting to, to see that you have a, a legislature that has uh, created these sort of zero tolerance policies uh, that school districts are bound to follow because that's what I don't get to choose what laws I follow and don't follow. And so, um, but my gosh, in some cases, uh, they are they are really restrictive uh, and very uh, damaging in terms mm -hmm. of uh, the child. So, but in terms of adopting a zero tolerance policy, mm -hmm. I don't have that. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Just, am I allowed to ask questions? Um, I just didn't know what the format so, was. So, I like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so for the 180 days, say they got um, suspended in the middle of the school year. Until the middle of the next year. So does it count summer days or is it um, only school days? Um, I'll have to find out. I believe that if we're in school, we count it as a school day. So if we're in summer school, the kids are going to come to summer school. Mm -hmm. But it is very possible that maybe just 
enrollment days, the 174, because 180 days was what school years were. Mm -hmm. and so uh, I would imagine summer school is not included, but yeah. I would imagine that with the board, we would be able to uh, advocate to say if that includes that time as well. Okay. Uh, we're going to be passing around papers. If you have a question, just write on the paper. Okay. Now, D Dr. Stiegelman, you wanted to bring up this MOU. Well, I offered it as a as, a, as something that we are doing to disrupt that the uh, <laughs> prison pipeline. Yes. Okay. Um, we read it and we were. It's wordy. It's dry. We were just a, a tad bit confused. Sure. I'm gonna let my colleague here express um, that. So what what about the MOU between the CPS CBD and the sheriff's department like is meant to disrupt? So you can just elaborate on that. Sure. So uh, if you look at the second paragraph, uh, just I'll read you one sentence. Uh, the, the first sentence in the second paragraph that says all of those entities, right, that you just mentioned up there. Uh, so the school district, the county sheriff's department, the the um, the thirteenth judicial court, which uh, oversees also it's the juvenile division, so also children's division, um, the police department. Um, so we all agree that first sentence. The parties agree that students may be held accountable for certain offenses but without referral to the juvenile justice system. So if you're familiar with the, the school to prison pipeline, the biggest, well, one of the bigger concerns is uh, a child um, who does this in school, right, is, is actually a, one type of assault. They didn't make contact with you, but if I caused uh, fear, uh, that's considered assault. And so um, I could, as a school district, call the authorities and say, this child just assaulted this child. Well, if that child then gets referred to the juvenile office and ends up going to a juvenile court and um, may get, not formally uh, supervised by the juvenile office, but gets a point assigned to the child. And you get up to a certain number of points and, and, and more extreme circumstances or, or consequences are assigned to that child as well. So this was meant to avoid as, as many times as we possibly could having to call law enforcement to, to get involved. So you'll see those definitions of third degree assault, fourth degree assault, status offenses, you know, child not coming to school. Um, so status offense says uh, the child while subject to compulsory school attendance, right? The state of Missouri says once you um, enter school, you're expected to come to school. So kindergarten is not uh, mandatory in, in, in our state, but once you start attending, then it's expected that you'll come to school. And so the child while subjected to compulsory school attendance, is repeatedly and without justification absent from school. And so uh, you could be referred to the children's division for that. Um, and what we're saying is we would like to find other ways to, to engage uh, the family. Uh, or a child disobeys reasonable and lawful direction of his or her parents. Um, or the behavior or, or associations of the child. So you can go through it. So you have all these definitions of what we would consider um, uh, items uh, that, that could have been uh, referred to children's division or to law enforcement that we are saying with permission this MOU we all agree that the schools can do school um, consequences potentially as opposed to actually referring to law enforcement okay. so um, and then it, it sort of goes through if there's been more than one incident what are the kinds of services that would be um, offered to the family so it's sort of a list of interventions that are there Hi, you must Hi. be justice. I am. Hi, <laughs> I'm so glad I made it too. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so it, it, it gives a whole list of just those possible interventions, about the meeting with parents, meeting with the school uh, representative or, or uh, counseling services, uh, if more than two reports, if more than three reports. And since this was first initiated, we didn't have the Family Access Center uh, face. And so that also offers uh, an incredible resource for families, for children and their families. So it's not just treating um, and supporting a family who may be in distress, but rather the whole family as well. So I thought it was important to note that um, what started in 2017 was a school district that created a, a, a memorandum of understanding with each of these entities so that we could avoid sending uh, children to them um, based on, on the ability to, to, to intervene from a school perspective. Now, of course, it says this doesn't address the Safe Schools Act stuff because I don't have the authority to to, to choose whether or not to follow the Safe Schools Act, um, but it does talk about um, the, the other uh, items. So I hope that that was helpful. Yeah. 
Um, but you know, I, I'm sure you have a, a website or something associated with the bridge. I think you do. I've seen it. So maybe that could be something as you're talking about tonight that that could be attached to, it so that so the community yes. can learn more about. It. In your opinion, has the uh, MOU been successful or effective? Yes, and I'll tell you why. Because before 2017, these entities were, it was more episodic in terms of the conversations that we were having together. Uh, and now the MOU requires, uh, it's a system that has been built. So you have monthly conversation, um, conversations about uh, specific students who may be struggling um, because the MOU speaks to sharing of, of information as long as it does not violate FERPA. Uh, and so um, the, the um, uh, looking at, um, so yeah, so you have just regular coming together, bi-weekly basis, juvenile office, meeting with our safety and security team. Uh, that's number one on page four, that it'll provide a school system with a current list of students and juveniles under the supervision of the juvenile office. That allows us to know uh, who may need additional support or a check-in, check-out type of system. So when a child arrives at school that day, they know they have a trusted adult that they can they can that they can contact and do with. So yeah, I do. Do I still think that there's work to do? Absolutely. Like this work is never ending. Um, particularly when you look at you know 20% of our students identify as African American, and yet uh, they make up uh, uh, you know about 40% of our suspensions. That that's a problem, right? Or if you have um, uh, nearly, uh, let's see, uh, nearly 50% of our students are on free or reduced lunch, but they make up nearly 90% of, of your out-of-school suspension. That's a problem. That doesn't mean that you don't try to engage and work on these things, um, but, but you recognize that the work is still ongoing. And, 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 uh, and so, you know, the fact that we're here that speaks to our commitment to them. So you probably want to pause and, and um, maybe... Again, uh, you know, superintendents like to try to tell people. So, um, here. Thank you. Once again, we want to welcome Justice Gatson. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Can you please explain what you do with the ACLU? And also, wh when it comes to the school to prison pipeline, what are you seeing? What are the trends that we're seeing? And how does this relate to the Columbia Public Schools? Okay. Hi, everybody. Please forgive my tardiness. I left KC at about 4.45 ran into all of that traffic at five o'clock, but I made it. And I'm glad I did, because um, I can tell y'all the truth about what's happening um, with the school to prison pipeline. Um, so what I do at the ACLU is I visit schools, I talk to educators, I talk to parents, I talk to students, I do know your rights trainings, I do know your rights specifically for um, what what can I do in school? What happens if I get into trouble at school? I also do trainings for parents to help them navigate the system um, if something does happen. And I champion and I advocate for our young people. Um, historically, uh, the Missouri compromise, right? So <laughs> let's 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 be real. It was um, mandated that we not be educated. And if you look from then to now, everything that people can do to stop black kids from being educated has happened and is still happening. Um, so the use of um, zero tolerance policies really helped to set the stage mm -hmm. even more for kids going, getting in trouble, right? Kids, um, these uh, high numbers of suspend, suspending kids for 80 days at a time, 90 days at a time, they're not gonna ever catch up. And they don't, they don't. They get, dis they get discouraged. And um, if they do try to enter back into the classroom, it's usually hostile. Yeah. Uh, students, um, sometimes educators will, some educators are biased. I will even go say most educators are biased and come into the classroom with these biased lenses and we see what happens. There are studies that even show that young people, um, this was a Harvard study, they um, said, uh, look at these young people and tell us who's doing something wrong or bad. And they had a black child and they had a white child. And um, you know, more teachers pointed out, the black child did something. At the end of this study, no child had done anything wrong. None. And so it kind of really, really points at the biases 
um, black students are, are getting in trouble for what I call childlike behavior, things that children do. Um, their white counterparts are not getting that same kind of trouble. Um, black girls are told that they're, they're sassy, right? And that's considered a behavioral issue, which black girls have been punished for. Same with black boys. Uh, numbers here have gone up, <laughs> that got better. Five uh, black boys are suspended at a rate of five and a half times more than the white counterparts. Girls are suspended at six times more than their white counterparts. So the number of girls getting suspended is rising. We have not lowered the number of suspensions between black boys. And I believe that we need to start addressing bias. We need to start addressing racism or these numbers are not going to come down. Teachers need to be, um, teachers need to go through anti-bias training. Um, there are a number of factors that contribute, but we keep going back to race. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Real quickly, Dr. Steepleman, are teachers in CPS going through an anti-bias training or anything for that matter? Yeah, so um, we uh, started about seven years ago, uh, worked with, uh, with St. Louis College, so um, uh, NCCJ, the National Conference for Community and Justice, um, and working through, we now have about 40 trainers, training trainers um, model, and so we actually have more trainers than we actually have in St. Louis. Um, and so what we require is all new teachers to go through three trainings. And now we're not just talking about race, though. We are talking about the multiple identities that I think uh, is uh, Gatsby, Dr. Gatsby? I'm yes. sorry, Ms. Gatsby yes. uh, mentioned. Um, uh, and so it's a, it, we talk about race, class, gender, sexual orientation, religion, ability, and we've actually added uh, language as a, as a module that we're working on right now. If you're familiar with uh, Dr. Mike Metz and the work that he does around language, um, that to us has been uh, really important. Um, and so uh, all new teachers have uh, an obligation of having to go through three uh, trainings a year. Um, uh, all second year teachers have to go through the same thing. And then if you're new to our school district, you may be uh, a teacher that you've been working somewhere else, but if you're coming to us, um, we've insisted that you have to be a part of it. And every faculty has to have at least two trainings a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I see Dr. Neville, who's our you principal over at Douglas. Yeah. We're feeling well. We're, we're to a lot of schools it. in the state. But we know that the work is not over, and it's ongoing, and, it's, and, and, and from last year to this year, our suspensions went up. And so you're saying to us, we're asking ourselves, um, what, why, right, and what do we need to do? But in terms of anti-bias work, that has been um, uh, some of the premier work that we do. Um, and then uh, we also um, initially started about, about uh, eight years ago or so um, with uh, the folks in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania around the restorative practices. Um, and so now, last year we had uh, nearly 90 of our, of our uh, teachers and leaders trained. This year it'll be 150. Um, around uh, days one and two of restorative practices training. Um, because we know that it's one thing to understand how one has been socialized uh, and, 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 to, and to step out of your own um, uh, understanding of how you have been socialized and understand how others have been socialized to build a better understanding. But then you need the tools to restore what has been broken if in fact you get to like, there's a catastrophic like, breakdown. Mm -hmm. but, but restorative practices, which I feel like, I'm, I'm sure my colleague from the ACLU will has even better information on, but it's like it's everything from your daily circling up as a classroom to build that community to the restorative conference at the end where you are asking each individual how they have been impacted by uh, whatever it is that has happened. So, for example, uh, this past week, well, I'll give an example of the past week, but I will use an, uh, uh, an example of uh, a couple of years ago. So, a couple of years ago, we had a student um, who who uh, sent out a meme to uh, uh, their high school um, that was a picture of Anne Frank uh, stand, and, and then another picture of a pile of smoldering bodies. And, and the meme said, what a great day for a barbecue. Now, I, I'm Jewish, so as you might expect, that uh, really hit home for one whose family um, had to escape to get here. So, um, but the question was, do you, do you say who the kid was? Do you, do you tell the whole community what the punishment was? 
Um, and, and we chose not to. What we chose to do was a more restorative practice, which was the child had to uh, do a virtual tour of Yad Vashem, which is a Holocaust museum in Jerusalem, had to do a, a, a tour of the uh, Holocaust museum in DC, uh, had to read Anne Frank's diary, and then had to, con we convened a group where uh, the child had to then um, give a talk about how destructive to the human spirit that mean was. So a couple weeks ago, uh, students from a middle school here in town uh, took a screenshot of, a, um, of the school's website. So it didn't hack our website, but took a screenshot of it and then manipulated it and then went to Google's site, which is not hard to actually uh, uh, to uh, upload an image to, and it was uh, uh, using the N-word, right? And so everybody wants to know, what have we done to this child, and what are we going to do to the, to the children who are responsible for this? What I would say is you could probably expect that we're going to do something very similar, because we're schools. Our job is to teach. Our job is to help children learn that what their actions are, um, what they've done, is destructive to the human spirit. Uh, and then to move forward uh, with that. But that's the very nature of, re of restorative practices. Um, not to kick a kid out for 180 days, not to kick the kid out for 30 days, not to kick the kid out uh, for, for multiple days. Because just like in the scenario that you read right when we started, sorry, I know sir, from, uh, I see that you're about to come in, you should know your rights for parents and students. Um, but you said, um, referrals and, and lost content, and, and you know, wouldn't it be better just to have them in the office? I don't believe so, but I do believe that we that consequences should be appropriate, and there should be consequences. It doesn't mean that you that, that everybody agrees what they're going to be, but uh, in this sense, it was about restoring what had been broken. Thank you so much, uh, John Logan. We have a question, a couple questions for you. First, being what does the job include of the director of safety and security, and also. Earlier it was brought up that relationships definitely need to be developed with students before sending them out, hopefully as a way to stop sending them out of the classrooms. Do you try and develop relationships with the children in your high school? Uh, yes, I do. So I'm actually assistant coordinator, so I work for a guy named John White. He's the director, so I work for him. He's my boss. So there's four of us. I am assigned four elementary schools and then Battle High School. So I've got a high school, four elementary schools, and part of what uh, my job is is to be a liaison between law enforcement and the school district, uh, specifically pertaining to my schools. But if there were uh, issues that took more than one of us, then I would help at other schools as well. Um, but what I love about my job so far is is that I have an opportunity to, to get to, to know kids and be a part uh, of their lives and get to know them and assist our administration team and our teachers. Uh, with if they're having uh, challenges in the classroom, so I guess an example of that is we had a, a, a young a young woman that started out as a freshman this year. Um, she was having some some fighting issues, some things like that. I was able to do, develop a relationship with her to where a few weeks ago she came into my office, sought me out, and said, "Hey, uh, you know, some things were said in the classroom." Instead of hitting her or punching her in the face. I decided to walk out and talk to you and try to de-escalate and calm down. So I see that as part of my role, as along with the school resource officer and the administrative team, um, to try to build relationships uh, with the kids at school to try to mediate as best that we can um, and proactively solve problems instead of just uh, singularly looking at law enforcement to do that. Thank you so much. Can I just have one last thing, just yes, in sir. the sense that. Um, so you asked about anti-bias training, and I talked about our equity work, and I talked about our uh, the restorative practices work. But unless you start getting down to the curricular piece, like the actual uh, looking at the curriculum, particularly how, how children are represented in our curriculum, the kind of texts that we choose, those types of things. Um, so uh, when uh, Nikki McGruder was working with DAP, or, or as the director of DAP here locally, we uh, the school district hired her to give us um, almost to do a cultural audit. And, and we were looking at, not almost, it was a cultural audit, where we looked at how do we, how do we conduct celebrations in our schools, um, and then and, and asked uh, for some recommendations about um, where do we go next in terms of particularly around curriculum, the books that we choose, and things like that. And so um, this, this year, 
um, we've been looking at what does inclusivity look like in our curriculum um, and how what a, a great benefit it is to live here in Columbia where uh, I mentioned that we're working with Mike Metz uh, but also Dr. Lagara King with the Carter Center um, is um, working with our curriculum coordinators um, to do not just one and done sort of uh, um, um, course with them but a regular uh, working with them so that we can look at through this lens uh, of equity is, is what does our curriculum look like, how are, how are our, our kids, their families, um, and, and not just race, but looking through all of the identities that, that, that each one of us brings to um, the work that we do, uh, how it's reflected in our curriculum. And so when you talk about anti-bias work, I mean, it's that as well, because we have to look at what we're actually using in terms of our curriculum. Okay. Thank you. Um, kind of a, another question for the panel as a whole, but especially we have a lot of educators in the room, um, especially in us in uh, elementary school educators. Um, so how can educators be prepared um, to step into these classrooms to um, deal with discipline, especially um, Ms. Justice, as you mentioned, with um, how to push back against biases that we just have? Um, yeah. Kind of speak to that. Yeah. Are there resources that we can use? What are the first steps that we can take primarily? I got a list. Thank you. Um, increased use of inclusionary discipline versus exclusionary. Um, inform students of their rights. Like clearly explain mm -hmm. the discipline procedures. Um, conduct internal evaluations in partnership with community members. One thing we develop a tool for teachers to use in the classroom for themselves to assess uh, bias. Um, it's a personal thing that they can do. To um, so that's a tool that we have. Yep. Um, no. We can include that on the page. Eliminate language in the school code of conduct that punishes for vague infractions. These words like defiance and disruptive behavior, it leaves too many things for one person to, for themselves to say, oh, I think that's, mm -hmm. and another educator may say, well, to me, you know, mm -hmm. this is what that is. This is what disruptive behavior is. This is what defiance is. Um, incorporate restorative practices, which you're talking about. Um, now this one is gonna be real controversial, but, Remove SROs from the school. Remove SROs from the school. There is a place. Be outside the school to protect the school. But police do what police are trained to do. And when a situation arises, police do what they're trained to do, mm -hmm. which usually ends in an arrest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we think that we need to remove them out of the school. Um, they're not trained for that. They're trained to arrest people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm willing to answer some questions about that if anybody has any. But a gentle reminder, we do have 15 okay. minutes left. Learn what rights apply when students interact with law enforcement um, and with the administration. So I, I briefly saw something about an MOU up, which is great. Great that you have one. But it's, what's more important is what it's, what's in there and um, what powers police have in the school according to the MOU. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Can, you sh is that share can we share it somewhere that yes. we can access mm -hmm. that? So everyone who signed in, and this is why we asked, yes. including the people in the overflow room, um, if you did include your emails, there will be a follow-up email from this team of students um, with these resources that have been referenced. So FYI, yes. Does any of the rest of the panel, would they like to speak? Um, I wanted to point something out. Um, so, and this is why, this is, uh, this, this points directly to why we think we need to remove SROs from school. Despite making up only 14% of student populations, black students represented 17% of all referrals to law enforcement and 18% of all school-related arrests in Missouri. So only 14% of the population, but way exceeds these referrals and the arrest. 
and black students with disabilities make up approximately 16% of IDEA enrollment, but represent roughly 20% of referrals to law enforcement and 22% of arrests. And so we need to do something different, drastically different. Um, we also believe that we can add people to that space, like community health workers. Mm. So I guess my question would be, is there a difference between having an officer in the building and having a liaison that is between the officers and the students and families? Do you think that's beneficial to have those liaisons? I would ask that of a community yeah. here. I can tell you what the community in Kansas City would say. I can tell you what the community in St. Louis would say. I honestly cannot say what people in Columbia think about that. Um, I, I just, I'm, where's the benefit? Like, what would that person do, right? What, what would they do? So yeah, I asked the question of what, what your job entailed because I didn't even know that job existed. I just, I'm just curious about what some of the ways on the position. Then we have to think about what the purpose of yeah. and the purpose for. We like community health workers yeah. because they're trained professionals, they know the resources in the community. So if it's an issue of, usually there's a, there's a root issue, right? Of why some child may be disruptive or doing something. Some kids are hungry. We got a school district um, in KC that is 90%, um, these kids are hungry. 70% are homeless. That's a huge amount of a population that's suffering. So having CHWs, community health workers, available. So if there is an issue, they are actually resourceful. They can be like, okay, I know where to get food from, and I know how to keep this coming to this family. Oh, you need a mental health referral. I can get that for you. You need to see the doctor. I can get that for you. Along with community health um, workers, behavioral therapists, people who are actually trained for that. Um, you know, the things that I see happening in schools with with kids, it's just crazy. Um, I did a lot, uh, my husband is over there, he and I used to do mental health work. And we know how to restrain the people without hurting them. Um, but oftentimes we see kids hurt in school from an interaction with a police officer. I heard you say something about um, children with disabilities as well, and I'm a special education teacher. So what do you guys, what's the difference between like, is there rules in place for students who may have a disability, and a lot of those behaviors come from a disability? So, aggressions and things like that. We absolutely look at that, and we know that that's a factor. That's why they're getting arrested more, because nobody is factoring in mm -hmm. that this child actually has, you know, this disability. And we're not looking at that. We're looking at, oh, they did this thing. Um, so we absolutely believe that that should be a factor. And we also know that most, a lot, I'm not going to say most, but a lot of children who are supposed to have IEPs do not have them. Mm -hmm. And if they do, they are not correct. Mm -hmm. They are not updated. And so it's a state requirement. It's right. It's a federal <laughs> requirement. Um, but it's not happening. And so that needs getting tighter on those IEPs, knowing what those students may need, um, carving out space for them. I had a principal who made an entire safe room for children that if they were having a bad day, this was a place that they could go and kind of mail out before anything, you know, got too much. So with the help of parents, students, and administrators, these ideas, the people in this community should be coming up with solutions that will work. So I, can I, do you mind if I just add one yeah. more piece? Yeah. Um, so um, when you have a chance to look at the memorandum of understanding, I'm gonna give you mind because I'm gonna ask you for feedback. Okay. Um, but uh, that last paragraph in that first page says, the guidelines in this agreement are intended to establish uniformity in the handling of student who's accused of having committed a minor school-based offense while simultaneously ensuring that each case is addressed on a case-to-case -case basis to promote a response proportional to the various and differing factors affecting each student's case. So we're talking about 
everything from the child's age, maturity, whether the incident involves uh, lots of different things. But but to your point, as a future uh, special education teacher, you know, um, I would be asking um, you, uh, if I were your principal, to make sure that uh, not only that you know what is said in the IEP, but the, any any adult who's going to be interacting with the child with a disability, if it's particularly if it's around. Um, Oppositional defiance, or those types of, of where the disability manifests in a way that could be violent, um, and then um, for those uh, who don't have a, a diagnosed disability, but there are some concerns. There are lots of professionals who can support, um, but particularly for a child who may be going through assessment, to make sure that something called an FBA is done, right? Right, functional behavior analysis. So to kind of look at what is happening and, and what uh, what might be uh, the reason why that's happening, right? And looking at uh, the function of one's behavior. Um, and, and so um, the teacher can also be trained in, in informally for looking at the functions of one's behavior. Uh, what is the child trying to get or get away from, right? So. I apologize sincerely to cut anyone off. But due to restraints of time, we have one more question. If you have any personal questions for them, I'm sure they would love to talk okay. with you one-on-one. -on -one. It's okay. She would be um, so what I was going to say. Sorry, I'm sorry. Back no, it's program. not okay because it's your program. But I just felt that was answered away. She's still going to answer. <laughs> yeah, um, the MOU that you brought up and the question you asked about your position and whoever else is part of like the safety and security thing almost sounds a bit um, contradictory because if we're doing these practices that are supposed to be restorative, we're taking out this direct referral to um, a law enforcement entity but we're bringing in individuals who have been trained for 17 plus years in law enforcement um, and not, you know, like within this system, it's almost as if we're bringing this, the prison to the students because they are being put in a position where they don't necessarily have an exit out of it and the liaison, and not necessarily like you as an individual because I don't know you as a person, right, right. but your position in that school is not going to be any different to the student if they know that oh this guy was an actual police officer and they're in this space being liaison um whatever that looks like for the different students so in other districts how it may work um being at a you know for you being at a predominantly black high school and what that looks like um i think it just it, it's almost backwards like people who are in part of the system have this power to change it in certain ways, but then the changes that are made are very minute, or they are they have this like appearance as though they are helping the community, but they're really not. They're just bringing in stuff that is like all this language that people, parents can't understand, and it's not helping the students, in my opinion. Thank you. So this is a question directed to all of you. Based on the trends that we are seeing, what do you feel your role is in both the schools and the communities? And we're going to start with John Logan. So uh, I've kind of hit on this already. And, and uh, you know, my role as part of the safety and security team for the school district is to work with our administrators, to work with our SROs and our police department um, and try to generate good outcomes for kids uh, that maybe have a lot of challenges. So part of that is going to be, for me personally, building relationships and also assisting uh, our school resource officers uh, and our administrators in, in building those relationships as well. You know, over the course of 21 years as a police officer in Columbia, I've developed relationships with a large part of our community. And those relationships, I think, will hopefully be beneficial moving forward in this role as a coordinator of safety and security. So building relationships and working with our, our law enforcement entities in the schools to try to make sure we have good outcomes for our students. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, I was thinking of what Ms. Gatson said about the Missouri Compromise. Right? This state was founded on a compromise. Um, and, and one that said, okay, there'll be slavery here, but not in Maine. Right? Um, this school district was founded in 1873. So just, what, eight years after the end of the Civil War? Um, and so one needs to think about the systems that were established, the housing practices that were created, um, access to nutrition and, and uh, health care and child care and wages and benefits and, and generational wealth and generational poverty. 
uh, that were either um, promoted uh, and supported. Um, so when I think back to that time, um, one cannot, um, you have to, because the work that we're doing, we are making changes. Um, it is encouraging and heartening to hear you say, I'm glad that you're doing restorative practices. I'm glad that you're, um, I perceived a support for the equity work that we're doing in terms of uh, the amount of time and energy we're dedicating to that work. And yet, we saw increases, right? And so it makes us really question and, and want to dig deeper into what can we do differently and how can we do better? Um, so I would say that, you know, I, I, am, I am proud of the work that we're doing. But that doesn't mean that I, I say that we're done. <laughs> we're not done. And I don't know if we ever will be. But I, uh, I'd say my role is to continue to be a champion for this work. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I became a trainer myself. I, I'm on those Saturdays with new teachers to say um, the body follows the head. And if this work is, is important to, to me, it's also why we have the school board goes through a regular equity trainings. They have at least two trainings a year. Uh, we did, uh, the last one was on ability. Um, and, and, uh, and, and that was important because there have been a lot of conversation around um, uh, ability and, and the spectrum of ability mm -hmm. and, and exceptional. So um, I'm, I'm, we should be proud to be working in a school district that is dedicated to this work, knowing full well there's so much more that needs to be done. Thank you. So I will, I will continue training our young people and the parents on the rights and visiting schools and taking a look at uh, their policies to see if we find anything that we can help schools with. We want to help schools uh, come into compliance. Um, the last thing, people get a little bit nervous when I step in the room, you know, because I think they think about litigation. That's the, really the last thing I want to do is take resources from a school and tie them up in court. That's not going to help any student. And I want teachers in their classrooms to feel supported, to have the things that they actually need to be teachers, and to have the supports in the schools because they are teachers. They're not behavioral therapists. They're not community health workers. And I want to try to get as many police officers out of schools as possible. Um, the whole notion of, uh, I've got a few things, you write, write these down. Warren versus District of Columbia. Castle Rock versus Gonzales. DeShaney versus Winnebago. These are all court cases. These are all cases that talks about police officers don't have a duty to protect you. They do not have a duty to protect you. People think that they do because you've always heard serve and protect. That is untrue, untrue, untrue. Our Supreme Court has said over and over again and has ruled time and time and time and time and time and time again. These cases, you can look them up yourself. The last ruling uh, came down with, what was the school that had the, um, sh the shooting? Uh, there's been so many, Parkland, yes. That was the last ruling on this, okay? The Supreme Court said again, I'm sorry, police officers don't have a duty to protect you. So we need to like drop the falsehoods around what we think and start embracing what we know and start looking at all of this so that we can make better decisions for young people. Thank you so much, everyone. You're welcome. I want to thank all of you for joining us. As Teresa said, you will all, if you signed in, you will be expecting an email from us within the next two to three days, including an, a, an attachment to the MOU, an attachment to the resources that Justice provided, as well as a survey that we would so greatly appreciate if you filled out for us.